NCR Corporation is a leader in omnichannel solutions, turning everyday interactions with businesses into exceptional experiences. With its software, hardware, and portfolio of services, NCR enables nearly 700 million transactions daily across financial, retail, hospitality, travel, telecom, and technology industries. NCR solutions run the everyday transactions that make your life easier. NCR is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 30,000 employees and does business in 180 countries. Good morning! <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm super excited to be here, um, mostly because, probably unlike all of you, I was not excited or into math and sciences. In fact, I was pretty bad at it. <laughs> um, now I'm known in the media as the female Indiana Jones, uh, but I took a very different sort of route and journey into science. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about today, because I, I want you to think outside of the box um, by the time that you, that you leave this. I, um, I always loved animals. Um, as a kid, I had basically a zoo at home with, uh, with dogs, cats, uh, fish, little creepy crawlies under my bed, and then, of course, my pet chicken, Margarita. <laughs> Um, now, I grew up in a big city. I grew up in Miami. I didn't have all the opportunities um, that, you know, sort of what you would imagine an explorer would have. Specifically, I grew up in an area called Little Havana in Miami. Um, my parents are Cuban immigrants. You can go ahead and laugh at my mom's hair. It's all right. There we go. Get it out. <laughs> um, so my first language is Spanish. And my parents were extremely overprotective because I'm an only daughter of, of Cuban parents. Um, in fact, when I asked my mom if I could join the Girl Scout, she said, no way, that is far too dangerous, right? <laughs> so to top it all off, I was also a cheerleader for the NFL. Again, not exactly what you would imagine a scientist doing in, in their spare time. Uh, but this love of animals, which I had no idea could lead to a career in science, uh, quickly transformed when I was in college at the University of Miami. And I took an anthropology class. And during that class, there was a section on primates. And I started learning about all of these amazing creatures uh, that were on the verge of extinction and that we knew nothing about. And so I got home one day and I, I started, well, I started reading Gorillas in the Mist and then I watched the film and these images of, you know, Diane Fossey cuddling with these gorillas, you know, really, it was my aha moment where I thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So that being said, um, I was a pre-law student at the time. I was uh, majoring in English and philosophy and I sort of switched everything up to pursue this. And the first thing I did was I wrote a grant and that grant was to go to South America to study this monkey, which is a, a white-faced sake, um, lives in Guyana. This is the capital of Guyana. Um, you have to remember, I'd, I'd never been out of the country. In fact, all of my sort of knowledge about the world came from my trips to Epcot with my family as a kid. <laughs> um, so I get there and I'm suddenly in this incredibly far and remote, unexplored region of the Amazon. I'll show you what that looks like, but it, it's basically a green abyss. And I lived out of this dugout canoe uh, for several months. And during my expeditions there, uh, you know, I, I learned uh, so much more than just what I went there to learn, which was about this, this monkey that had not been studied before. Um, I, as you can see, was completely ill-equipped. <laughs> In fact, I had taken a, a Calvin Klein because I was sort of, you know, trying to be fashionable even though I was going to be in the jungle. I'd taken this Calvin Klein field vest that after months and months of having been rained on, I looked at the tag and it said dry clean only. <laughs> um, but one of the things that happened that was sort of pivotal in my career is I was taken in by a local family and one of uh, the villagers was a local wildlife trader. And um, they invited me to go on one of their excursions into the forest and I wanted 
to see what they were taking out of the forest, how they were taking them out. And this really changed my sort of my vision of what I thought I'd be doing in the scientist. And it's really the moment where I became a conservationist. And I think it's important for all of you to know that you might be going down a certain path um, and you may not even think it's related to science. And it's okay to you know, veer off and, and explore those things that interest you, which is what happened with me. Now, when I came back from that trip, uh, I really sort of had the bug and I wanted to go back out and I really wanted to make a difference. There's never been a more exciting or necessary time to pursue the sciences. And I was reading this uh, magazine article in Time Magazine and it's entitled Death Row and it's talking about the 25 most endangered primates in the world. And of course there were these beautiful images of these monkeys like the golden lion tamarind but then there were these line drawings, the ones that you see there, the Perrier Shifaka and the Silky Shifaka. And I thought, how bizarre that they used line drawings. And so when I started to research this, what I learned was is that the reason that there weren't any photographs is because none were in existence. These animals had never been studied before. We knew nothing about them in the wild, except that they were about to go extinct. And so for my next expedition, I decided to go to Madagascar, and I know that's what you all think about when people talk about Madagascar. Um, and it's just like that. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but let me give you, I'm going to show you a short clip um, that will give you a sense of the wonders of exploring Madagascar. Here we go. So you've got um, these amazing frog species in Madagascar that are found nowhere else on the planet. Uh, you've got, of course, these incredible geckos and chameleons. This is the world's largest chameleon, right? Exists nowhere else on Earth except Madagascar. And then in contrast, you have, what is this? The world's smallest chameleon. That's right. Exists nowhere else on the planet. And that's the same thing for actually all, almost all of the animals that I'll talk to you about and that are in Madagascar. This is a black and white rough lemur, only found there, the golden bamboo lemur. You've got these beautiful shifaka species. Um, of course, the dancing lemurs, <laughs> which you're all familiar with. And then one of my favorites, this is the indri, which is the largest of all the lemurs. There used to be a lemur the size of a gorilla, not that long ago, which was hunted out. And now this is uh, the next largest, uh, largest species. Now, I felt right at home the first time I ever set foot in Madagascar. The people are incredibly warm and friendly. Um, the landscapes are unbelievable from coast to coast. Uh, you've got these beautiful baobab-lined avenues. Um, the problem in Madagascar is there's overpopulation. Like in a lot of these places where you have a lot of biological richness, it's also extremely poor. In fact, it was just named the poorest country in the world. And then having said that, less than 10% of the original forest remains in Madagascar. So here you have a place with, with incredible biological richness and diversity, and less than 10% of that habitat uh, still remains. So on my first expedition there, I went to study that, uh, that Shifaka species that I showed you the line drawing of. And here it is, the first photograph ever captured. And as you can see, the animal's running away. <laughs> um, I spent months and months and months and went through all sorts of like, um, there was uh, no, no food because there was a drought. Um, we, we couldn't find uh, water easily. We couldn't find the animals. And then when we did find the animals, they would run off and we just kept going, never gave up. Thought about it sometimes, it got really hard, but never gave up. And what ended up happening is, again, went into a village where one of the village elders said, I know where we can find those animals. So we walked for, again, 10 more hours that day, and we got to this spot, and they were all over the trees. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I started taking photographs of them. I couldn't believe that they weren't running away. And what, we, what, what I found out was is that the reason that they weren't running away is that this, uh, this one area is where people went to mourn 
when their relatives passed away. So they were almost habituated already. Uh, they were used to people being there and they were not being hunted because it was sacred ground, so they trusted us. So I was able to collect months and months of information on these animals that had never been recorded before. But then something else happened while I was there. I started looking at the differences between you know, them and the other lemurs. Here you have the all black, and then here you have the all white. And they were geographically very isolated, and that's when I turned my attention uh, to conservation genetics. And so you know, people always say, well, what does a scientist look like? And you kind of imagine someone in, in a lab coat. And all, these, all this time, I had been out in the wilds chasing animals. And suddenly, I, I would need to be in a lab coat, you know, running their, their, their genetics, looking at the DNA. And so I'll show you this very quick clip of how, how many of you have ever caught a lemur? Raise your hand. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a quick clip of how we capture the lemurs. And, uh, Maria and her team idea. continue north to Madagascar's Merajeji National Park. Somewhere in this rainforest paradise is a critically endangered, almost pure white, silky shafak, among the rarest of all lemurs. They hike for two more days, reaching areas of virgin forest. She knows they're getting close. But finding the rare lemur in these dense woods will be no easy task. Now it's time for Maria's team to fan out into the woods in search of the silky shafak. There are no real paths here. They can only keep track of where they are by taping markers to trees along the way. After several hours of searching, Richard at last spots a flash of white in the treetops. Maria is one of a handful of scientists in the world to see the silky shafak in the wild. Nothing is known about them. This is the first time that they've been part of a long-term study, so everything we see is the first time that it's ever been recorded for this species. And the excitement is about to get turned up a notch. Right before we capture animals, all of our adrenaline levels soar, and there's this feeling of excitement and anticipation and fear that something might go wrong. To get the lemur, Richard must shoot it with a tranquilizer dart. Too much pressure, and he might cause a fatal injury. Too little, and the dart may not reach its target. His aim must be perfect. And it is. I think it's all the female. Yes? Like a squad of paramedics, the group carefully brings the sedated lemur to a clearing where they can examine it. For the first time, wow. a silky shafak will be a part of a genetic study. I'm gonna get this stuff out. And while we've got the animal down, we try and take as much information as we can. So little is known about them, and they've never been part of a genetic analysis. So no one's gotten blood samples from them and been able to compare them to the other shifaka. <laughs> so we'll be able to find out a lot. Maria also punches out a specimen of tissue for the cornerstone of her research. This tiny piece of flesh will help create a genetic profile of the species and yield important clues that may help them survive in their shrieking habitat. So those samples are now housed in the San Diego Zoo in what I like to call the, the frozen zoo. Um, so for more than 15 years now, I've been a National Geographic explorer. Um, I've gotten to travel all around the world, um, learned enormous amounts from the local people, including the, the Maasai warriors, 
Um, I have done documentaries on sharks uh, using a lot of scientific technology like shark sonics about what sharks respond to, why were they were coming into areas that they previously uh, weren't coming into, and why were they showing aggression when they previously are they're just not generally aggressive animals towards humans. Answering all sorts of questions um, about uh, leopards in Namibia, and then of course, continuing to explore all of these places. And that's one of the things that I really want you to take away from this is, I know that we live in an age where information is at our fingertips, like constantly. And we sort of think we know all of what's out there and we have all these answers. But the truth is, is that there are so many places yet to be explored, so many new discoveries to be found. And that's why I say it's such an exciting time to be a scientist. Um, I'm gonna show you um, this, this quick uh, story because National Geographic sent me on assignment with a scientific team uh, made up of other scientists of herpetologists and botanists. Um, and they asked me, have you ever climbed before? Now remember, I'm from Miami, it's really flat there. And you know, my idea of mountains were the, uh, the, these large trash mounds that were on the way to Orlando, right? The landfills. And so, on top of it, I was kind of afraid of heights as well. <laughs> um, but let me just show you what sort of scientific exploration can look like. I've never climbed before. It is steep. I just remember. I don't want to look down. You gotta get, you gotta get attention on this. Yeah. All right, hey Zeus, I'm really coming down. <laughs> remember to keep your legs shoulder width apart. wrong. If the anchors come out, the rope frays, we'd have no recourse. First mistake, I looked down. <laughs> I looked down again. Let me see. Uh, can you let me see what I have to I'm pretty scared. I've never done anything like this before. And now that I've done it, I just can't imagine not having done it because I would have so regretted it for the rest of my life. This is just amazing. Above the clouds, the ropes had been set and we could move into position. It's beautiful, bro. Look, all those creeks. No wonder you guys have spiders and snakes and whatnot in this place. Wow, talk about a room with a view. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go hook your um, daisy chain on. This one, this one, and this one are all like kind of good. Not this one. We had finally oh, arrived at the wall camp, but it's a ledge three feet wide with a precipitous drop below us. Right. And then crawl sort of along. in hanging tents attached to the rock face with a single steel pin. Good night. Good night. God. That little clip is gonna hold <laughs> both of us up. We should have had less dinner. All right. So it took me a while to go to sleep that night and my, my uh, herpetologist friend thought it would be really funny to shake the tent right after, yeah, we miss him. <laughs> Um, but what I love about this particular expedition is, again, here was the place in South America. Uh, many people had attempted to do this climb and explore these areas and had not been successful in doing so. And so this op opportunity presented itself where we were able to go out there and for the first time describe uh, five new species of frogs, uh, thousands of different types of new plants. And uh, it was a really amazing expedition to be a part of. Now, eventually, I got to go and study the, the western lowland gorillas, not the mountain gorillas of Diane Fossey's site, but these were sort of mystery apes, because even though they're the ones that you see in, in zoos, they're the ones that we know least about in the wild. And I'll just share, you know, again, 
you wouldn't think of this as sort of the, the science because, you know, as you could see, my laboratory is a very big open space with wild animals. But here we were uh, looking at the differences between the males and the females. And one of the things that I've learned is that gorillas, just like everyone in this room, have very distinctive personalities. They're all incredibly different. So you have this silverback and his son, and the son was really annoying the dad. And suddenly the dad gets up and starts pounding his chest and really starts to go at his son. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the mother comes in and punches the dad, <laughs> right? And then in typical teenage fashion, what does he do? He celebrates the fact that that mom just stood up for him, right? And so this is kind of the crazy stuff that I see out there while I'm watching the gorillas. Um, I've continued uh, for, again, for almost 20 years, I've continued my work in Madagascar. It's a very special place to me, and there are still so many questions to be, to be answered in this amazing uh, island. And uh, one of my trips took me out to the northeastern part of Madagascar, where I found this little guy, right? And it was not really, it had not really been described. Nobody really knew what it was. So we went back, and National Geographic came on this trip, and they filmed as we searched uh, for this creature again, which it's, uh, it's small, it weighs less than two ounces, uh, it's nocturnal, so it was incredibly difficult to find. And of course, it was monsoon season, which made it even more difficult. And we were out there, we finally spotted one in the trees, and uh, we, were, we were really excited, we weren't really sure how we were gonna capture it, because usually we use little Sherman mammal traps. But then we had the idea of pulling this tree slightly towards us, and my tallest guide, Laud, who's, uh, who's amazing, uh, he reached up, and as you'll see in this video, he was able to hand catch this little animal, because luckily for us, its defensive strategy is to sit perfectly still if there's a predator, <laughs> hoping not to be seen or detected. <laughs> so. Um, it's, it's pretty cute, and it's okay to say that as a scientist. It is a really cute animal. And you know why I say that? Because communication is an incredibly important part of being a scientist. And, you know, anything that gets people to care, anything that gets people interested and excited about the work that you're doing, it's all right to say. Um, as you can see, we, we uh, waited until the following morning. We started doing all of the sort of the workups. We took blood and genetic samples so that we could later, back in the States, run these in a, in a lab and confirm that it was a brand new species. And the amazing part of this is that it turned out to be a brand new discovery to science. World's smallest primate, one of our closest living relatives. And I was able to take these photographs and this information and go to the prime minister and president of Madagascar, who then got so excited and inspired by this discovery that they declared the area a national park. So now the thousands, thank you, the thousands of other species that live there are also protected. Thank you.